uh, my name is Mirna, uh, by the way. My name is Mirna Ayad, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, I think I speak on behalf of uh, all of us when we say uh, we're not uh, sitting here with one titan, but two. It's such a privilege, honestly. I'm so glad uh, that I'll be moderating this session. Thank you to the El Sirkal team uh, and Abdul Munam, of course. I believe you're going to give a few words first. Yes. Please. Assalamu <coughs> alaikum. Ashab al Maali wa Saada, as Sayyidat wa Saada, Duyofna al Kiram. لطالما كانت تسامح قيمة إماراتية راسخة في ماضينا وحاضرنا تعززها منظومة الولاء والانتماء الوطني وتزيدها تجذرا علاقات التبادل والقبول والانفتاح على الآخر كركيزة من ركائز هويتنا الوطنية والعالمية غرس, له غرس المغفور له بإذن الله الشيخ زايد طيب الله ثراه برؤيته وروحه الريادية قيم التسامح في نسيج هذا الشعب وبينما يعمل كل فرد منا على خدمة المجتمع بطريقته الخاصة فإن مسؤوليتنا الجماعية تفرض علينا الإسهام في تعزيز مجتمعنا ونهضته وتقدمه ومع احتفالنا هذا العام بمرور خمسين عاما على قيام الاتحاد يسعدنا أن نحيي بكل فخر واعتزاز الرؤية الرائدة لقادتنا وعزمهم مدركين في الوقت نفسه أن أفعالنا ومواقفنا اليوم ستحدد الإرث الذي نتركه للأجيال القادمة ينضم إلينا اليوم معالي الدكتور زكي نسيبة المستشار الثقافي لصاحب السمو رئيس الدولة الرئيس الأعلى لجامعة الإمارات العربية المتحدة ومعالي نور الكعبي وزيرة الثقافة والشباب وكلاهما من القادة البارزين الذين يواصلون ترسيخ قيمنا وتأصيلها ويعملون على بناء جسر يصل بين تاريخنا العريق وتجربتنا الحاضرة الحية بسمات الشمولية والقبول في جوهرها تهدف سلسلة حوار الثقافات بدعوة من أكسبو 2020 ومبادرة من السركال إلى تقديم منصة للنقاش حول القضايا الحرجة اليوم وحديثنا اليوم بعنوان الانفتاح والطريق إلى الازدهار تديره مرنا عياد مؤلفة كتاب الشيخ زايد ولن يكون هناك مكان أفضل لاستضافة هذه الندوة من جناح دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة في أكسبو 2020 واسمحوا لي هنا أن أعرب عن امتناني لفريق الجناح ولمكاتب أصحاب المعالي وفرق أكسبو 2020 والسركال على جهودهم البناءة في تنظيم هذه الندوة ختاما اسمحوا لي أن أدعو مرنا عياد مؤلفة كتاب الشيخ زايد للتحدث مشكورة Thank you Thank you, thank you so much um, I have so many questions and the good folk at El Sirkal have also sent me a whole bunch but we're going to start with mine first <laughs> I think what I would like to start off by asking is what is tolerance actually? Is it something humanitarian? Is it something religious? Is it something spiritual? What is it and, and how do we practice it? And I'm going to go with ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. It's wonderful to be here. I would like to thank uh, Abdelman and Belma and the team for, for hosting us today um, in, in the UAE Pavilion. Um, and I have to say, going before His Excellency Zeki, who I call Bu Anwar, uh, you always make the room feel better. So thank you for existing. Um, defining tolerance, I think there are many definitions, and let's move away from um, definitions that we read in, in dictionaries and the updated versions of dictionaries. I think we, we should have a new uh, definition of tolerance um, that is based in a domain of, of, uh, of a moral um, definition or of a moral domain um, and, and looking at how we as, uh, as citizens, as Emiratis or as global citizens, look at it with, with a conscious, with conscience and with care. 
uh, care when it comes to uh, caring for others, for the plight of others, of being open, of accepting the differences, whether it's a religious base or authenticity or a nationality. Um, and I believe, you know, the more we, we focus in such a domain that has respect surrounding it, you know, we, we tend to disagree and we tend to tolerate and be intolerant to certain topics and subject. Wow. So I, I believe it's, um, it's, it's where we as humans need to start being accepting ourselves and therefore hopefully being open uh, and respecting others. Um, this, is, this is my take when it comes to tolerance. You call him Bu Anwar, I call him Ammu Zaki. Ammu Zaki, what do you think? Thank you very much, Ammu. And I also want to say what an honor and privilege it is for me to be with all of you and with Her Excellency Bint Muhammad, who always makes us feel so happy uh, to be in her ambit and in order to listen to what she is saying. Let me start by saying, you know, I do not like the word tolerance. Uh, I believe it's a misnomer. And it's not something that I myself had thought about initially. But uh, I remember His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed uh, when he had an Italian artist, Guy Ferrar, uh, do this sculpture of tolerance that he, we have in front of the Crown Prince's office. It was up there since 2008. He told the majlis, open majlis, he told us, I don't like the word tolerance because it means almost you are accepting somebody that you believe perhaps is inferior to you mm. or you accept something that is not particularly uh, good but you are ready to tolerate it. And unfortunately, it's the same word in most languages, except in the Arabic language, where we have the difference between tasamuh and samaha. Mm. And the samaha is a word that is closer to my understanding of tolerance uh, that we use today. Samaha is the ability to empathize with others. It is the ability, I, you know, we all read Milan Kundera's, for instance, the unbearable lightness of yeah. being, where he says, you know, it, to, to, to merely to tolerate makes, that makes you feel superior to others. Mm. You need to feel the suffering of others. Now, for us, this is the meaning of tolerance as practiced by the founding father, of course, Sheikh Zayed, but also as practiced in the UAE society at large. The, the idea of samaha, uh, empathy, more than just tolerance, is what makes us human. Mm. This is what takes us away from whatever uh, dark recesses there are in our, unfortunately, in our insides, and make us uh, closer to what human beings should be. You ask, is it religious, is it spiritual? Of course, it's all of these things, and it's none of them, because mm. religion can be used as a means for intolerance. It means for violence, and so do any other ideology. Tolerance is basically what makes us be human and what teaches us to respect and love and feel empathy with each other and to suffer with the sufferings of others. So well said. So well said, both of you. Thank you. Um, we had the first church in Abu Dhabi in 1962. Abu Dhabi Television, 1969. In the same year, at Tihad Newspaper, 1971. Al Ain Museum, 1970s, the early part. The UE University and Majid the comic, the Cultural Foundation in 1981. Amuzaki, you once told me, Sheikh Zayed visited the Louvre in the 1950s or 60s and said we should have such a museum in uh, the UAE. And in 2017, uh, we welcomed the Louvre as a sister uh, of the Louvre Paris. I think that one um, major aspect that contributes to tolerance is multiculturalism. We taste other people's food, we see other cultures, uh, we learn about their histories, and the UAE is really where a lot of this happens. We have that, you know, that kind of access. Um, how do you feel multiculturalism feeds into tolerance? You know, multiculturalism is the key uh, to having an open society that uh, has respect of human dignity at its core. 
at, at, at the, at the, at, as a basic foundation. Uh, you talked about Sheikh Zayed and his visits to Europe. I mean, the, one of the first books that were published were with a British author called Claude Maurice in the early 70s. I yeah. translated long uh, interviews for him then with the author where he told us he visited Europe, he went to un museums, he went to hospitals, and he wanted to do all of this when he came back to the Emirates, although at that time there was no income from oil. I mean, there, there was an economic depression, there were very few resources. And then, of course, when he started as, as r ruler of, of Abu Dhabi and then president of the Federation, his main focus was always on education and culture as an intrinsic part of the education process. You cannot really have an education system if it's not founded in cultural uh, flowering as well. Hmm. And in the very first interview I had with him back in 1968, so it makes me feel ancient and it shows you how very young <laughs> you are, uh, Sheikh Zayed basically said, we need to open our country. This was in 1968. We need to open our country to the world to bring in modernization, so that is multiculturalism. But at the same time, he said we need to keep an equilibrium between the rate of modernization and development and opening to other cultures while retaining our own heritage, our own national identity, our own traditions. And this is again the secret, I believe, uh, key to what is happening in the Emirates, to be able to have 200, above 200 nationalities yeah. living together in harmony, to opening up to world cultures, but at the same time, as we see here in this pavilion that is looked after by Her Excellency, and with the many ideas that actually were inspired by her, to see how tradition and heritage and our past remain as a central part of this multiculturalism. You know, I was, I was wondering how far in the discussion we were going to get talking about tolerance without mentioning Sheikh Zayed, and it's impossible. Um, you know, when, when the government rolled out with the year of tolerance, it wasn't something new for me. You know, I felt this, it's the very foundation of, of, of this country. So these concepts are, are actually not new. Um, Amuzaki, I'm going to quote you from a... When no, are no, we no, going no, no. Start no, actually, I'm, this question is for Her Excellency, but I'm just going to quote you. Okay. In an interview that we did in May 2019 for the Sheikh Zayed book, you said, and I quote, he was a people's man. He would listen to everyone and respect everyone. He truly felt that the human race was a family. He really believed in the story of Adam and Eve and that we are kinsmen. He believed that God created us for a purpose, and this purpose was to help each other. I call him a Renaissance man. You always felt like he just wanted to help others, and that's what kept him going. He believed he was put on earth to help others, and would say, people are asking God for help, not me." Unquote. I want to ask you, how this pull, 16 years after he died, what, what is this? We all, you know, subscribe to, to him. We want to follow him. We want to... What is that? Well, um, there is a quote by, um, by Socrates. Um, the unexamined life is not worth living. And, and I believe Sheikh Zayed uh, didn't live by examining Zayed the person. Mm. He lived by examining the land he, he was brought up in, the son of the desert. He examined how life or time will unfold when it comes to his dreams in the UAE. He examined what is the best way to, as his excellency mentioned, be selfless, welcome the world, to, to his land, and at the same time, give the world. And there are multiple stories of Sheikh Zayed giving the world, even with the first barrel of oil, yeah. transiting out of the UAE. So, so what's happening here, we're having a leader, a founder of a nation, 
where he gave us a gift. A gift that in a few weeks we will be celebrating yeah. the 50th because of him. Um, why are we celebrating the 50th alienation? Is because of a man of the desert who in his 20s opened his arm to a British explorer in 1948, I believe. Thesiger. In the 50s, he went to the Vatican. Mm. In the 50s, he went to New York for his brother, mm -hmm. late brother Khalid. In the 60s, opening up a church in Abu Dhabi. In the future, we're having the Abrahamic family house oh, yeah. in Abu Dhabi. I'm getting to that. What, what's happening is there is a timeline. This, nothing is coincidence. Mm. And I think the gift and which we still feel after 16 years, and I still remember so vividly the moment the news was um, announced of his, of, of his death. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, you, you have your moments that you will remember like they were yesterday or more than yesterday. And I think the gift that we are as, as Emiratis and fellow residents who Sheikh Zayed called for urban planning, for hospitals, for policies, for economy. He, he asked ex expertise, and he didn't ask expertise for a selfish reason. He wanted them to feel like home. And I think, and if, if I'm not wrong, Bu Anwar, I think Thesiger, or not Thesiger, someone, he, Sheikh Zayed gave them his, the house of his wife to stay in in Al Ain. Maybe the Kennedy, the, 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 the Kennedy, Kennedy, the, the Kennedy. The Kennedy, we call them the Kennedy Hospital. The Kennedy the Hospital. The hospital. So establishing the first hospital, there was no, clinic. or was clinic, a clinic. <laughs> yeah, clinic. He gave them the, his house. He wanted, he wanted them to feel that they're home. And I feel the gift that we have today is Zaid blueprint. Mm. He left us a blueprint that we should follow on. You know, I would like to add to this, I fully, it fully resonates with what, with, with what I know and feel and believe in, and I think, you know, Bint Muhammad, Her Excellency, has brought this out truly. But what I would like to add to this is to say the reason he is still around with us. Well, I, I mean, two, just two simple reasons. But the first one is that when we talk of Sheikh Zayed, we talk about a school of government. Mm. You know, we talk about a nahj in the Arabic. We talk about a thaqafa, a culture. We talk about, and this is the nahaj, this is the, the, the pathway that he has uh, set out for us, and this is exactly the nahaj that the present leadership was brought up on. You know, all our present leaders were brought up by Sheikh Zayed, and they took from him, and therefore we feel we, still, we are still living his legend, even today, and this is why people still remember him today. Mm. But I think also the second reason you know, uh, we still believe, think of Sheikh Zayed in this way because he was truly a unique historic figure. You know, when the British political agent at the time he became ruler was called Archie Lamb, mm. and he just incidentally passed away three or four days ago, having oh. reached a hundred. Wow! Uh, but he wrote in one of the diplomatic reports, dispatches, when Sheikh Zayed came uh, to power, he said that. You know, Sheikh Zayed will become the ruler. He's not the oldest of his brothers because when he became ruler, he was a younger brother. Yeah. But he said, but he is, a, he, is he said, a person of a particular uh, allure. He is a, a man as we dream of, the prince of a desert. And he said he walks with his bisht, wafts the scent of paradise. Wherever wow. he walked, there was in his trail always bounty, you know, he, he was a person who was always giving out. And this is why people today still have them, I believe, have him in their memory. Thank you. Your Excellency Noura, now I'm gonna quote you. This is from our interview in April 2009. You said, some, quote, some men went to him and said they discovered a monastery in Sir Baniyas and that we should hide it or destroy it and not let others know that Christianity was here. And he said, this is great news. It means I had ancestors who believed in another religion. He was proud that his ancestors came from another faith. He welcomed the idea wholeheartedly. 
A cleric once told him that some are celebrating Christmas and we mustn't allow it because they're drinking wine. And Sheikh Zayed said, so what? This is how they celebrate it. Amuzaki, you told me as well once about the excavation of um, Al-Hili and how that material went to the first Al-Ain Museum. And you say to me here that they found remains of a community that dates 4,000 years ago that traded with Mesopotamia. And how Sheikh Zayed was equally keen on building the museum and he wanted to show that his land had a history and that his people traded with the rest of the world. Personally, when news of the Abrahamic house was announced, I was elated. I was so happy, I was so proud. And I personally find it quite telling that it sits in the cultural district. And I wanted to ask you to tell us what are your thoughts on this initiative? What, what do you hope it will do? What does it say about where we are today? Is that for me? Or for it's for both of you, <laughs> but you can go first. You know, uh, Sheikh Zayed's view on religion was truly uh, fundamental to his thinking about life and about death. He always said that had God wanted us all to be on one, born into one religion, it would have been in his power to do so. We do not choose our religion. We are born as Christian, mm. as Muslim, as Jewish, as uh, Hindu. As, uh, but then he said we can judge a person. And it's not, in our, it's not for us to judge God's design. We can judge the actions of other men around us when they do good that means they are religious. And when they do not do good, mm. that means they are not. It's that yeah. simple. Yeah. The Abrahamic ha the houses is to say that God is one. But how many times have we seen that God violated by his own followers? From whatever religion they may come, they take religion as a means for a different ideological purpose. They take religion as a means in order to create hatred inside uh, of themselves to have uh, defend, to have division between me and the other and the Abrahamic houses the concept behind them the concept of that all religions share in the one God the one God who teaches us love and mercy and empathy and sympathy for others is the one God and that we need to work together in order to achieve his purpose so that is one way I view it and the second way I view it is this message for peace that Sheikh Zayed was always promoting around him. To say that God has created us uh, in order to create well-being around us, not in order to bring dissent and war and conflict, not in order to destroy each other, but to help build one another. And it is this concept of peace, the concept that was reflected in the uh, document of human fraternity when the Pope came here, this is why Sheikh Zayed visited the Vatican in the 50s, is to say we have one God, he teaches us love, he teaches us we must have peace with everybody else so that we can build our nations, and this is the message for me of the Abrahamic Accord. Um, can I add, um, you know, adding to Bo Anwar's story, I think there is a story that is really worth mentioning about Sheikh Zayed uh, after 9-11. Um, and I believe this is a, an incident that affected everyone, <laughs> everyone, um, especially us um, who are living in the midst of a region mm. uh, where still there are political fights, extremism, um, ideologies that driving people to hatred and, and whatsoever. Um, and, I, and I believe after the 9-11, Sheikh Zayed took a decision of sending Emirati troops to Afghanistan. And uh, this is a story that is said by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, where he went and he um, asked his father, but that means we're fighting a Muslim. Oh. And that Muslim is bin Laden. Sheikh Zayed's answer was, no, we are fighting for Islam. Because what bin Laden did is something that is not whatsoever related to our religion. So how are we protecting the image of Islam? How are we protecting the 
or being uh, individuals who are responsible for such com common uh, care of or feeling of pain, the pain of others or, or, the, uh, or the suffering of others. And I think that is a story that, with many stories, even with His Excellency Sultan al-Jabr, when we were going to bid for the IRENA file, yeah. going to certain countries in Africa and sitting in with one of the leaders and saying, okay, I'm here to, you know, to get your support for winning the bid, X, Y, and Z. And then one of the leaders, he says nothing. He asks him, come with me in the car. They drive together. And he said, you said Sheikh Zayed, right? He said, yeah, he said, that is a village built by Sheikh Zayed. So don't tell me who Sheikh Zayed is. Aww. And I think this is where, going back to the point of this human, of a, of a strong message that is delivered with action. Um, and you know, and, and no, no matter what religion, what political um, circumstances, there was just one voice. And, and for you to be a good person, you need to be human before being religious or whatsoever. Thank you. I think like all uh, uh, principles, they begin in the home. And um, this reminds me a little bit about um, when, I, when I interviewed Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed for, for the book. I asked him, obviously, my first question was on his father. And he said, before we talk about my father, we should talk about my mother. <laughs> <laughs> so you had told me, Amwazaki, about Sheikh Salama, Allah Yerhama, and what values she instilled in Sheikh Zayed. Um, you know, the home, you know, the, the early years, what we instill in our kids. And you had told me also, one of the stories that impacted you the most was when the country was founded on that day in December 2, on December 2, 1971, he mentioned women. And he w mentioned how important a role they will play, I mean, even from then. So through his mom, through his wife, Sheikha Fatma as well, and that um, when you were appointed, and then Sheikha Mohammed bin Zayed took you to see uh, Sheikha Fatma, and she had tears in her eyes to see all these women you know, joining, joining government. I want to ask you, what role can women play or do play when we talk about tolerance? Ladies first. Well, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, you listen to kids with their dialect and you always see that they're more influenced by their mom's dialect if it's different than the father's dialect. Mm. It happens a lot. <laughs> um, of course, each member complements a family, and, um, and, and I feel this is where the mother's role in a household is so crucial and so important, and everything, I believe, starts at the house, starts at home. Then comes the school, then comes whatever it is, work, your exposure, but the moment your mother instills on you curiosity, care, empathy, questioning, uh, being able to question, and not being afraid, and m not being restricted to a certain uh, frame mm. of this is, well, we all, we all did naughty stuff when we were young, I guess. But did you also? Well, <laughs> for another talk, maybe. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, going back, even with, the, with me growing up, um, seeing my mother go to school, she was a principal of a school. She, bless her, she still works. So seeing that example in front of my eyes was always also inspiring. You know, going to school, she was a principal. It doesn't mean I had special treatment, treatment. whatsoever, no zero, <laughs> but... <laughs> That kind of a sets, a, sets a, an inspirational kind of an example in, a, in, in, in the way I grew up and in the way I saw life. And of course, my father being the military man and everything is with routine and everything, but uh, you know, there is always a phase where your mother is more there than your father and then mm. your father you know, just 
gets in in a certain phase of life, enjoys, <laughs> enjoys it, and then certain <laughs> phase of life, he, this is where there is an input. And uh, so, Sheikha uh, Fatima, every you know, every time there is an event happening, or um, or a guest coming to the palace, the first question she asks, "What can I do? How can I help?" It's always, what can I do? How can I help? She still, she still carries the responsibility that Sheikh Zayed used to carry. She was an, she's an executor of how it helped create the women foundations across the UAE, how to encourage education among women, how to encourage them to be in a workplace, how you know, the more diversified sector there is and the more women, this, this made you know, made her day or made her happy. And, um, and I think this is where we, sometimes it, it gets, you know, we get this question from certain international media groups. Oh, how, so how is woman empowered, oh, yeah. empowerment? Oh, oh, so how are you, how do you feel being X, Y, and Z in government? Well, women used to spend six months without a husband when they go on pearl dive and whatsoever. So it's this kind of separation of context and history and in the story of the UAE or the tradition of the UAE that is very much, again, connected and linked to where we are today. Hmm. I'm sorry for the long answer. No, but not at all. Uh, I mean, you remind me of when I used to be asked um, at, uh, during my time at Art Dubai by international media, so what's it like being a woman? in the art scene and I said well I don't know about you and, and where you come from but for us it's a non-issue we do this maybe in where you come from it's an issue being a woman but for us it's you know completely fine and I look at around us so there's women dominating the the art and culture scene so I, I I totally you know subscribe to that Amuzaki you mentioned to me once Margaret Thatcher asking Sheikh Zayed um, that you know about his mother you know that you know that she was a special person and she's and he told her she was the kindest most courageous woman i know and wisest and wisest as well how do you see uh, we, we heard her excellency i want i would like to hear you tell us what can we do as women you know what how can we play a greater role when it comes to tolerance specifically First of all, I believe the empowerment of women was one of the main keys that led to this amazing uh, achievement, to this amazing uh, level of achievement that the United Arab Emirates have been able to get to. It was the empowerment of women from the very beginning, as Her Excellency said, uh, starting with Her Highness uh, Sheikha Fatima's role in establishing Women Foundation, in opening up schools with Sheikh Zayed for boys and girls, uh, insisting that children even should be paid salaries so that their parents would uh, be encouraged to send them to school. And I believe as Sheikh Zayed and Her Highness Sheikh Fatma always said that women are half of society. They are the mothers, they are the sisters, they are the wives, they are the daughters, and unless we empower them and make them a central part of our economy, of our country, of our state. How can we survive? How can we go forward? But then I believe when you talk about tolerance and the role of mothers and women in this, and incidentally, both Sheikha Salama and Her Highness uh, Sheikha Fatma are a long, uh, in the long tradition of women who played a very important role in Emirati society from time immemorial. In contrary to what the public image has of women in this region, they've always played a central role, especially as Her Excellency said. I mean, the men would go on pearling expeditions for four months, five months. It was the women who ran society. But to come back to the issue of tolerance, you know, we all know you have your baby, uh, beloved child, and we all know when we have children, they are born uh, with the tabula rasa. You know, you can write anything. On, on a child's mind. And they are ready, as uh, Her Excellency said, first to the mother, because that is the closest relationship that evolves between a child and a different uh, human being. It's this relationship of mother to child. 
this is why, the, as it says in the Quran, you know, the, 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 what enables women to go through this hardship, this suffering, this pain, in order to have a child, because it, uh, there is this love and, and feeling of wonder that comes with the birth of a child. And But also forgetting. <laughs> And <laughs> forgetting, and forgetting that we went through it. What you went through so that you can do it again. <laughs> But you know, after that, with this tabula rasa, it's what you write on it. Because the child can grow up into being, and to either you encourage him, him or her more towards what a human being should be, which is to have this, the, the, fee, the moral compass that uh, bin Muhammad is speaking about this ethical uh, nature, this ethical, yeah. uh, the moral values that you grow up with, this empathy towards the others, you write it into that child, or he, you write into that child a pathway that leads it in order to become selfish and self-centered and, and avaricious and, and nasty and eventually violent. And, mm. so, and this, is, this is the fundamental role of mothers, of course. But then it goes on into society because if you have women negotiators, I can assure you, you will have better <laughs> uh, peace treaties between nations. If you have women you know, standing up for climate change, you can face our challenges better. <laughs> When we have women, as we do here, standing for our culture mm. and fighting our fights, we can achieve more. So women not only play their role as mothers, and the, although this is a primordial role that is so important, they play it in our society. Unless we give them the ability uh, to, to, to be really an active part of our political system, our military system, our every security system, so that they, can, they bring uh, this sense of uh, human, if you like, uh, empathy towards others, they bring sense. Uh, into men, much of the dealings of men, unfortunately. So we need them. And tolerance requires women to be at the helm, uh, right there, sharing it with men. Excellent. <laughs> Does the world feel divided to you? Yeah? Yes. I mean, you know, it's sad. Uh, there was a time when we all felt that the world is converging towards a more stable equilibrium, where we thought that uh, we are moving into the global village, where we thought that the principles of enlightenment that came from the 18th century onwards, gradually uh, making us more human, more open to each other, more accepting of each other's differences. We see, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, economic and political and geostrategic, but also climate uh, change and also poverty and also bad governance and also corruption and also political failure of many of the regimes around us, we see societies begin to break up again. Hmm. You know, we see those societies. You look at what's happening in the Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, just around us. But you also look in Europe. And I do not want to mention countries so as not to be, make, say anything insensitive. But around us, uh, you find, yes, unfortunately, societies are breaking up, going back into tribal uh, closed chambers, uh, bubbles. Uh, we find dissent again becoming the lack. And I hope that we will be able to overcome this, because unless we do, unless we do, we, we, will, we are going down a slippery path. And as I said, look at what's happening around us to, to see that this is true. How do you think tolerance is the glue that can put us together? Well, thank you, Anwar. I think going to His uh, Excellency's point, um, we're also in an age of uh, uh, a virtual ex extremism with the, with the cancel culture, uh, you know, uh, kind of movements. If they, if they want to shame someone, it's like a virtual kind of a square where he's he, or he or she is shamed and out of context and and I think this is where we have this multi layer of of such if it's domestic or regional uh, conflicts and and now virtual and and what that leads into um, yet of course you know there are 
there are good things that are happening as well. Uh, there are good things. And I think the focus on the good things is, is something that we want, to, um, we want to focus on as a nation. As, as going back to Sheikh Zayed's blueprint uh, of, of how can we um, you know, focus on goodness. Um, with the work that we're doing as well as the Ministry of Culture and Youth and uh, with the UNESCO uh, and the project of the uh, uh, Revive the Spirit of Mosul, um, rebuilding a Nuri Mosque and mm. two churches, the Sa'a al Tahira. I mean, for us to see Christians re restoring the Nuri Mosques and Muslims restoring the churches, this by itself yeah. shows how after a conflict or ha after a horrific kind of a conflict that happened in Mosul, we can get people to build their future again. Uh, alleviating the pain they went through because we felt the pain. Because His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed felt the pain the moment the leaning Manarat was, uh, you know, demolished. Noura, we have to do something. Let's work on restoring and rebuilding uh, that mosque. And, and, and God forbid you wake up in your city and you miss a crucial element of yeah. your skyline, which is the spirit of your city. I mean, how will this affect you from a, in a, from a psychological perspective as well? So I, I think what the question is with the hatred, with the cancel cultures, with whatever it is, what can we do to, um, to soundproof ourselves uh, and focus on and what is good and how are we defined as humans, um, either by agreements that, are push, that they push for peace uh, or rebuilding uh, monuments. I have my last question for you before I um, uh, share with you some, some questions that we have from the audience. Hamouzaki, your first trip here was in 1964. And then um, you served as translator and advisor to, to Sheikh Zayed. You are an encyclopedia for all of us. Um, and I'm looking forward to just recording everything you say and do. Um, with the seeds that we have sown so far, what are we going to reap in the next 50? That's yours and your excellency, Noura. What role do you want the youth to play? Well, let me tell you then about my vision for the next 50 years. You know, I am a born optimist and I have seen what has happened here against impossible odds. I have seen truly the nation rise uh, from the obscurities of dissent and conflict in a, in a, in a, in a, in a conflict-riven region of the world, and I saw it succeed where everybody thought that it would not. And within 50 years, it took us from where we began under military and security threats to be today exploring space, sending a probe to Mars, and about to send a probe to Venus. So this, this um, um, amazing jump you know, between universes, it's, it's social and it's political and it's economic and it's in the mind, it's a mind revolution. I see a stretch ahead of us, 50 years, and I am meeting the young people, the young generation of Emiratis today at our universities, Zayed and the UAE, New York University and the Sorbonne and all the other universities, the Sharij, I, I don't want to name them all, but young, bright students. And I see that they have the same defiance and the same, uh, and the same commitment and the same engagement. And I see a leadership that has an equally w wide vision, an ambitious vision to get us to be number one mm. in 2071. And I am positive that my children and my grandchildren will live to see a glorious number one country, UAE, in 2071. Inshallah. Inshallah. Well, I can't top that. <laughs> but your, your question is different. <laughs> well, I forgot my question. I totally forgot my question. <laughs> it was, what role would you like the youth to play in the next 50? What do you want well, them to do? He answered it. <laughs> 
I think, I mean, I mean, okay, for who didn't tour the Emirati, the UAE Pavilion, the story of the UAE, it starts with the sand. Mm. It starts with our first dreamer, Sheikh Zayed. Mm. So, as His Excellency Bu'anwar mentioned, yes, have a global lens, but you need to be proud with your identity. You need to be connected with your identity. You need to know your history. You need to know your literature, your, your history books, your stories. You know, sit with your parents, with your, with your grandparents. I think that connection will make us unique. And even the people who are living in the UAE who, and who were born in the UAE, we all have a story to say. Whether we, w we are from the UAE or f not from the UAE, we all have a common story to say because at the end of your tour in the pavilion, dreamers who do, the dreamers who do are, again, Emirati citizens and our fellow residents. The dreamers who do are, 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 are who believe in, in the UAE story or in the Emirati story. And I think we, we hope that they will inspire other generations or other nations. Um, and and uh, and our responsibility is is to lay the tracks. You know, how can we lay the tracks and solidify it in a way that will make them confident to what's next? All right, I'm going to ask you questions uh, that came in from the audience. So this is for both of you. What advice would you give to young people today who call the UAE their home? What advice would you give to young people today who call the UAE their home? I, um, well, my advice is, or I don't know if we're, we're again, giving advice is something that is, uh, carries a huge responsibility, but I think if you call UAE home, then it means that you're already responsible. Exactly. That you're already part of the UAE, of, of UAE's um, dream, of UAE's message, of UAE's path to the future. So um, I think if, if, if that is the case, then we're all in together and we all have the same message to follow on. And going back to Zaid's blueprint, I think there's those bases or pillars, let's say Za the Zaid pillars, um, that are quite universal and timeless. Uh, you know, the UAE is their home because the UAE is created around this founding idea that it welcomes all those who want to come and share in realizing our dreams. So for everyone who wants to be part of this dream, who wants to be an effective and loyal member of this community, that is moving forward with the UAE, no matter what nationality and what background and what ethnicity and where they come from, the UAE has always welcomed uh, those people and said, this is your home. Come mm. and be part of our dream mm. and let us share the glories of this dream together. And, and dream with us also. Um, Amuzaki, I have for you, actually both of you can answer this because it's university. What's the best way to integrate tolerance within the education system? Well, this is a very important question. Uh, but as what, uh, incidentally, let's stop calling each other excellencies. What <laughs> Bint Muhammad has said, <laughs> I am Zaki or Abu Anwar or Ammo, whichever is easier. But, but you know, uh, Tolerance, you start, of course, at home. As I said, you start with the child. It's a parent's responsibility. It, we always think that we should leave it either to schools or universities to teach our uh, children uh, how about tolerance. But then I believe, yes, I mean, part of the, uh, f f the focus of university teaching should always be the humanities. It mm. should always be philosophy. It should always be uh, the social sciences, even for we are, of course, focused on STEM subjects. We believe that sciences are important, artificial intelligence, technology, this is the future. But it is fundamentally important that we also have them open to liberal uh, education courses because that teaches them to have to develop critical thinking. 
It helps them to be able to differentiate, not have everything seen as black and white, but to see the nuances in between. So I believe, yes, to, be, to focus on a liberal kind of education that you offer at your universities, within, embedded within your uh, STEM subjects even. And this is something that I know the uh, Education Council that is chaired by His Highness Sheikh Abdullah and with all the ministers and people involved in education, involved in it, they f believe in this, uh, in this philosophy. And uh, adding to um, Bo Anwar's points is with, with the work we do in education is how we embed arts and culture into education. We're doing it in a parallel perspective, whether in schools, and we're doing it as well with passing resolutions that were anonymously agreed on in, in, in our work with the UNESCO. So, um, and, and, and there is always the story of Newton. When, when, you, when they see, say Newton, what do you remember? The apple that falls yeah. from the tree. But who articulated that story? It's mm. Voltaire, a philosopher. Newton didn't articulate that. So with science, with all the respect, we need philosophy. Mm. We need music. Um, we need maybe a, a, a multi-religious curricula that makes the student understand different faiths, different beliefs, um, and just allow such, of, such as questions um, and for them you know, to, to build their own perspective you know, mm. and, and not to force them into a certain belief or a certain kind of, a, you know, with, with, with force, things don't work. No. It doesn't work with force. It, it has to come from the heart, I believe. So, um, so I think that is a, an element that we will start looking into much, much closely when it comes to education. Um, you remind me of something uh, Sultan Al-Qasimi from the Bergil Art Foundation once said. He said, arts, um, it's part of the humanities because it's what makes us human. Um, and, you know, seeing what your ministry is doing and Ammo, you with, you know, with the Office of Cultural Diplomacy, thank you both. And thank you for today. Um, I'm going to close by introducing uh, Danabel Guterres. She is a spoken word poet and will be reciting three poems for us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will be reading you three poems today. I'm going to start with a poem that was specifically written for this event. You know, sometimes poems come immediate and complete, and sometimes they come as jigsaw puzzle pieces. This poem came as the latter, um, which I think was a suitable metaphor about how we learn about people. When we meet them, we only see their little puzzle pieces, and it's only through time and patience and effort do we get to know them fully. When we talk about tolerance and inclusivity, I think about the willingness um, and humility to say to our fellow man, I know we have our differences, but I also know we have similarities. So let me learn from you what I do not know and let us share and celebrate what we do know. This poem starts with an epigraph by Barbara Jane Reyes that says, the elders want to know when they may lead you back to water. This poem is called Bodies of Water. Allegedly, water forgets. A half lie, half told, fully believed. Listed in water, they say, and it will stream from the creek to the sea, never to be thought of again. Tell me, you've never laid in bed after swimming, feeling like you are still boying in the waters and after years of drift and float and splash like a wave shored salt water body in desert sands sea foam defending the coast defending the brown of earth and skin this is where 
we intersect. The point where our waters meet, we marvel at the skyline. Our dreams draw lines connecting the stars into constellations, guiding us through this voyage of life man has embarked on for decades. Imagine a hand extended. The spirits of old telling us where they meant to go for us to continue the journey. Allegedly, water remembers a half-truth, half-believed, and fully felt. History in droplets reflecting the past, imagine. The memories of our ancestors nestled deep in our marrow, our veins, channels, red rivulets of personas inherited, bequeathed. You are just like your father, your mother. Your laughter reminds me of your grandfather. You have your grandmother's patience. Pinamanang pangunawa at pakikisama beyond tolerance is acceptance, is to say my waters recognize your waters, honors it, flows with it, is to say kinship is the epiphany of oneness, is knowing how storms become air only to become rain again, is the resilience to find where our lines meet the way our grandfathers sought and sailed for the horizon line, how they dove from boats for fish and pearl. Ana Filibinea, anak ng perlas ng silanganan, bint al danat al bihar al sharkia. Our bodies are 60% water, we are made of oceans. Padayon is to say we will persist, we will consistently coarse like rivers carving ridges on stone. Thank you. Um, so I thought I would personally introduce myself to you before I read any more poems. I am Danabel Gutierrez. I am Filipina. I am an artist, primarily a poet. I'm also an art consumer, and as such, I gravitated towards ekphrasis, which is a form of poetry that, was, um, that has been inspired by another art piece, either as a description or as an elaboration. This next poem was written after Pasita Abad's painting, The Village Where I Come From, which I thought was a perfect way of introducing myself so that you know where I'm coming from. Alin sunod kay Pasita Abad, where I come from. I come from green. Ancestral roots bloom intricate pink, embroidered on the earth, homes like fruit. On ancient family trees, the constant blues of salt water and sky. I long for roads and maps, hills long for the scent of my hair to go freely through. Front doors instead of windows or cracks on walls to put down this blanket full of skin. Heavy on my head, even my honesty makes me feel like a thief. I have borrowed tongues just to be understood, only to be felt and even still not fully. To be Filipina is to go through eyes of needles to make, to sew the rips, the tears. I am silk and flower and leaf and knife. I am river and ocean waves soft and crash. I am flow and drown. I am mustard seed small. Watch me grow. Thank you. I'm going to leave you now with this poem that was birthed because of the whole 2020 situation. <laughs> During May of this year, my friend and I were driving through the boulevard after about a year and a couple of months of not being able to do so. And as we were driving, I was filled with this feeling of how much I missed the city which was strange because I never left. And to miss something 
You must love it, or at the very least, like it very much. Um, I grew up in a transient state. I spent my childhood in Manila, Cairo, Vienna, and Muscat. And the UAE is the country that I have lived in the longest. Matter of fact, in about three years, I can say that I have spent half of my life here. So it is an absolute honor and privilege to call this country home. And this poem is my love letter to Dubai during the pandemic, missing the city while I am still in it. This poem is called Ode to the Love of My Life. I am jealous of American poets and their big apple love poems, sonnets to the streets and fire exits, romanticizing bagels and yellow taxis. Someone told me I would fit in New York like it's easy, like I could grow wings, like I've never been denied. Maybe another city would make me a better poet, a better lover. Perhaps I am devoted to you. Even when my mother told me to flee to ice, I planted my feet and grew hands. I miss you within a fortnight. I miss you even now while we are dust apart in this bed city large, how we are almost one, unable to be seen without the other. A year and a half later in the garden, in my bedroom, jealous and seething of all the reckless love other people get to have with you. I wince at what they call you when you're not listening. They don't know you like I do. I am hanging on a branch, one side open, an apple hollowed out by wasps, like a ballroom archway with translucent walls shedding self and skin. There is no name for this love unowned, not belonging to each other like saffron, tea in styrofoam cups, faces lit by the blue of the car stereo like whispering, prayers to lesser deities who never respons respond still. Still, I make believe we're in cahoots secret knockings at secret restaurants, floating down the creek for a dirham, sunsets on the metro, fairy lights on the boulevard, two hour drives through mountains of stone and seven colored sands, fruit stalls and carpets, how you would point to the camels on the highway, occasionally gazelles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran Wayed. Maraming you. salamat po. Thank you so much. Thank you.